Our story begins at the start of the 20th century, when Ernest Rutherford at McGill University in Montreal first describes radioactivity and half-life using the terms alpha, beta, and gamma. For his work, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1908. Rutherford worked closely with the first female Canadian nuclear physicist. Harriet Brooks described atomic recoil and the transmutation of elements via radioactive decay, fundamental observations that fuel modern science. She was considered second only to Marie Curie in the field. Trained as a mathematician and physicist, Harold Johns was deeply interested in using his knowledge for cancer research. He led the development of the first Cobalt-60 beam therapy unit, which advanced cancer treatment and saved millions of lives worldwide. His work shaped the modern field of medical biophysics and advanced imaging in Canada. Using radiation as a tool, James Till and Ernest McCullough firmly established the concept of stem cells and set the framework in which stem cells are studied today. They developed the first quantitative clonal method to identify stem cells and used it in pioneering studies that provided crucial information about blood cell development. Wilfred Bennett Lewis spent his career solidifying Canada's energy independence. An innovator in energy production, Lewis fostered a connection between Atomic Energy of Canada Limited and Ontario Hydro that led to the creation of the CANDU reactors. Hailed as the father of CANDU, he spent his life promoting Canadian nuclear science, both on the United Nations Scientific Advisor Committee and as a professor at Queen's University. In the early 70s, Abram Petkow's pioneering work revealed the radioprotective effects of superoxide dismutase. His research with artificial cell membranes generated early evidence for the inverse dose rate effect of radiation. Visionary scientists leave behind footprints for others to follow at the organizations, universities, and hospitals where they made their seminal discoveries and where scientific breakthroughs continue to this day. On the West Coast, Triumph Canada's Particle Accelerator Centre is researching particle physics on a level consistent with the finest facilities in the world, advancing science in space, medicine, and industry. Triumph is the combination of more than a billion dollars of public investment over 50 years, returning incalculable benefits to Canada and the world. On the Canadian prairies, the Light Source Synchrotron Radiation Facility at the University of Saskatchewan is at the forefront of physics, biology, and engineering a cornerstone facility in illuminating the structure of molecules and trace elements in biological materials. To the south, near Toronto, McMaster University is a world leader in neutron scattering technology. Neutron scattering is an integral process in detecting material stability at the atomic level. McMaster Nuclear Reactor has been at the forefront of this testing since its inception. Today, almost all jet engine turbine blades are tested at McMaster. This testing would not be possible without the pioneering work of 1994 Nobel Prize winner Bert Brockhaus. A giant in the field, Brockhaus conducted foundational research into neutrons at the Chalk River Nuclear Laboratory and taught and mentored countless scientists at McMaster University. The Princess Margaret Cancer Center is one of the top five cancer research centers in the world. Started in 1952 as the Ontario Cancer Center via an affiliation with the University of Toronto, it today houses the radiation medicine program which is ranked in the top three such programs in the world. One individual who contributed from the early years was Gordon Whitmore. From 1971 to 1996, first as chair of the Department of Medical Biophysics and then in other leadership roles, he mentored scores of radiation scientists. Whitmore was also the president of the 9th ICRR in 1991 held in Toronto, along with Secretary General Don Chapman from the Cross Cancer Institute in Alberta. Researchers at the Cross Cancer Institute made seminal contributions to our modern understanding of genetic susceptibility to ionizing radiation. Each of these locations is part of a larger Canadian federal family, including the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission, Health Canada, and the Canadian Space Agency. All important threads in the tapestry of Canadian radiation science. But the story of the Canadian nuclear program starts as a response to the dangers of World War II. The small town of Deep River, turned out to be the ideal spot to revolutionize radiation science. The Canadian nuclear project grew out of concerns in World War II. At the very beginning, just before World War II started, they discovered the process of nuclear fission. 
After the war had begun in the winter of 1940-41, the French had this heavy water, they took it to Cambridge, and they concentrated actually on the use of heavy water as a moderator for fissioning U-235. And they decided in the summer of 1942 that they would move their program to Canada. They chose the Chalk River site to become the extension of the Montreal Laboratories. And so with that, the Canadian effort focused on building a big research reactor. NRX came in in 1947. It was the world's best research reactor when it, it came in. At one time, it was actually occupying about 40% of the research effort at Chalk River. It was huge. NRU then followed 10 years after that, and the expectation was that the lifetime of these reactors might be a decade, might be 15 years, because no one knew there's all kind of changes in material. And W.B. Lewis, who was the real father of CANDU, he had the great idea of the next thing after NRU, the next huge jump, would be something with a much higher neutron flux for all the researchers. In 1962, a new discovery was about to change the way Canadians made toast, and it was doing it with a can-do attitude. The can-dos were individually 500 megawatts, or the ones at Bruce, 750 megawatts. CANDU technology and the CANDU reactors have been really beneficial in Canada and around the world. So they are some of the safest and highest performing reactors out there right now. Particular to Canada, it's provided us a significant amount of energy security. We mine it here and we can manufacture the fuel. So that ecosystem is critically important to the CANDU industry and it's unique to Canada. CANDU reactors are proving their value around the world, with new reactors being built domestically as well as high-profile projects in India, Korea, and China. The idea of energy ecosystems with control and detection of waste at a scale previously unrealized isn't just a pipe dream. Canadian visionaries put their genius to the test in developing systems for waste management while preparing the world for the next wave of energy innovations and ecological maintenance. There's this circle of things, right? You, you get the energy that you need and then you produce waste. And nuclear is no different. You produce the energy we need and then we produce waste. And the waste is there, but it's solid. Canada has a plan for a deep geological repository because putting things in the air or in the water and you don't know where it's going or what effects it will have, it's something that we should not be doing anymore. For radiochemistry, there is naturally occurring radiation everywhere in the environment, and you have to take that into consideration and kind of form these mass balances of an entire system. And a lake 20 kilometers away could be completely different. I want people to really believe that we are truly open in our science and that we are very passionate about protecting the environment. Radiological imaging and radioisotopes for cancer treatment are just a few of the practical benefits of Canadian radiation science. The number of lives that radiation has saved worldwide, and a large portion of that has been from the isotopes from Chalk River. MOLLE 99 is one of the important isotopes for diagnosing. For a long, long time, Chalk River and a 60-year-old NRU reactor was producing 50 to 60% of the world's supply. Chalk River is instrumental in shaping the nuclear medicine industry as we know it today with the NRU, which was the workhorse of the industry uh, for the last six decades uh, until uh, recently. With the production of isotopes here have been responsible for over a billion treatments worldwide. Isotopes like uh, iodine-131 are pioneering in nature in terms of their application for radiotherapy, thyroid cancer treatment, as well as cobalt-60 for sterilization and uh, medical treatments. But isotopes like molybdenum and technetium which is basically the workhorse of the nuclear diagnostic industry. There are about 40 million procedures performed worldwide using technetium. The second application of medical isotopes is sterilization, which includes sterilization for medical treatment using cobalt-60 to treat blood and medical sterilization for medical devices and also for food sterilizations. Right now, we're producing through generator production, actinium-225 here at CNL. I think we're one of four, maybe five in the world that have this capability. We produce it more for targeted alpha therapeutics, but also collaborate with several universities and institutions. Production of clean energy and improvements in healthcare provide obvious benefits close to home. 
but the scope of Canadian science extends far beyond that into the fundamental nature of the universe itself, which may involve looking deep into the Earth rather than out into space. Located two kilometers underground, Snow Lab is home to some of the most amazing and unique research on the planet, research so profound it may reshape our understanding of the structure of the universe, like Art McDonald's research on neutrinos. So the reason for going two kilometers underground in the Creighton mine is the fact that neutrinos are very penetrating particles. They come through the dense material in the sun with essentially no impediment. And they also come through, therefore, the rock two kilometers above us. On the other hand, the cosmic rays are reduced by a factor of a million or more. And so in building the snow detector, we were working in an environment with the combination of the suppression of cosmic rays by the rock above us and the cleanliness of the local radioactivity and the choice of very low radioactivity materials in the detector, we were working essentially with the lowest radioactivity location in the entire world. And that has been carried over to the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, or SNO, or SNOW project, to SNOW Lab, where in 2003, we started constructing a laboratory at the same depth in the Creighton Mine, but three times the excavated capacity of the SNOW experiment itself. In the original SNOW experiment, we were able to determine that two-thirds of the electron neutrinos produced in the sun were transformed into the other two neutrino types before reaching the Earth, which solved a puzzle that existed in the previous experiments starting in 1968. The field of radiation detection is very, very exciting now because we are now in the era of uh, multimodal astronomy. It's not just nuclear radiation, but gravitational waves, which is a form of radiation. And we have had detection of gravitational waves. We have had detection of neutrinos coming from galactic sources. So now we are in this mode where we can observe objects in the universe with many different kinds of radiation, which are drastically different from each other. And that gives you a great deal of insight into the reality of physics. Canadian radiation sciences and nuclear energy programs are among the best in the world, continuing the mandate of working towards the betterment of humankind. Every day, radiation scientists in Canada are advancing knowledge, saving lives, improving the environment, and working to make the future a brighter place it is in the spirit of goodwill and optimism that we salute Canadian radiation science. Thank you, Canada. Merci beaucoup. Be curious. Continue to be curious. Be nice. You can do so much more if you have fun when you're doing your experiments. You don't have to be a pushover just because you're nice. <laughs> you still have to be strong and, and to the point, but it's very good to be nice to other people.